Good evening. I'd like to welcome, welcome everybody to the recess, recessed session of the NAGS Head Board of Commissioners. It's Wednesday, August the 17th, and we're going to call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item is the adoption of an agenda. Do I move to adopt. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Um, our next item is audience response. I do want to ask, um, ask a favor, I guess. Uh, we, we, do, we do have um, beach driving a little bit later in the meeting, and what we'd like to do is have all those comments come at that point in time, if that would be right, and we're going to have the, the staff give their presentation and then get people up to, to talk about it, if that's all right. So it'll be a little bit more of a discussion than a, just a comments. Um, so with that said, uh, we're going to open, open it up to audience response. Is there anybody that cares to come and speak before the board, if you will? If you will give us your name and your address, and we'll love to listen. My name is Gary Oliver. I'm the Outer Banks Fishing Pier. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you all for stopping beach uh, bulldozing. It's been a long time coming. It needed to be done, and, and uh, you all did great. I'm proud of you, but that's not why I'm here. The other day, I was cleaning my bathrooms at the pier. Uh, one of them overflowed a little bit, and, and uh, I do that quite a bit. And I went up, and Warren, who works here, said, you don't read the article about ha what happened to Nags Head Board. And I read it, and I figured I had to say something about it. I've been holding back, but this is something that, that bothered me a lot. Uh, Jeanette's pier, they said that they would not harm the, the local peers, that they would try to respect us and, and not compete with us and try to support us. And the first thing they did, they, uh, they said no sightseeing fees. Uh, they, they lied to us, and that broke the trust right there. It, it surprised me, and I appreciate you all trying to get them to add that. I know they've got a donation, but that's not the same. Uh, at this point, I'm way down on, on sightseeing. And I heard the reason was money. Now, I've got a figure here, 97,000 people went on that pier recently uh, in the last 60 days. They had 115 people a day fishing on the pier, charging $12 a day. I charge nine. I don't get that many people. But let's talk about Jeanette's Pier. They don't have a mortgage. Do they pay town taxes, property taxes? Absolutely not. Do they tr charge sales tax? No sales tax, no mortgage. How much did they pay for the beach nourishment, the sand in front of the pier? Nothing. Uh, and, and here they want the town to clean their restrooms. <clears throat> My restrooms are public restrooms also. Anna, you, can, you know, uh, Bud, you worked there long enough. Uh, we let people use it. We had lifeguards down there all the time. Now, I, I would say that if you're going to give Jeanette Pierce some money to, to uh, clean the bathrooms, maybe you ought to do mine as well, because I think it's ridiculous for them to ask for that money, until at least you get some figures. I don't, e I don't think you all even know how much money they've taken in or how many employees they have or what they're doing. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out and let you know my feelings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Lowe? Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners, for hearing my little speech here. I'm a longtime resident of Nags Head. My name is Angelina Lowe. I would like you to consider another possible use of the building that CSI occupied next to the Brit Haven nursing home. When the Outer Banks Medical Center first had the building and closed up some time ago, the building stayed empty for some time. My thought then was what a great location and building for a community center. So here I am again with the same idea, but this time I wanted to share it with you. Wanchi, Stumpy Point, Man's Harbor, have centers, so why not us? This center could be used by people of all ages. A place for our civic associations to hold their meetings instead of having to find a different place every month. Groups that just need a place to sit down and talk. A place where someone could hold a covered dish dinner or a fish fry to raise money for a sick person a shelter for some people in an emergency situation. 
Think of all the ways this center could benefit our community. I know it's not a simple thing to do. All I ask is you look at this as another possible use of the building. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else for audience response? Seeing none, we're going to close audience response. There, there will be an opportunity later on the beach driving. Our next item is recognition of our town 50th anniversary committee, and I'm going to ask <coughs> Commissioner Sattler to handle that if she would. Thank you, Mayor. John Ratzenberger, would you meet me up here, please? <laughs> For you're in trouble. <laughs> John, on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, I'm up here this evening to say thank you. I know when you took the job as chairman for the beach, uh, for the beach, for the beach's 50th anniversary here in Nags Head, Good catch. Um, it was a, thank you, um, I'm, I need to practice. It was a, um, a kind of a, yes, I'll take it, but gosh, but you did. You took the ball and you ran with it the whole way. John has been through perils before, but I don't think anything quite like this. He was tasked with an almost impossible task. I remember Mayor Bob Muller telling us years ago, you need five years to plan for Nags Head's 50th. John planned in less than a year, I think, um, with the help of a committee, and I just want to tell you that from the Kelly's Day Parade in March to the art at the school uh, in April to the art at the town hall in May to our big event, um, the daytime and the evening time, the gala in June and then the five days of carnival, um, you were an exceptional leader and I just want to read something to you that the Board of Commissioners um, want to present to you this evening. The Town of Nags Head Board of Commissioners presents this award of appreciation to John Ratzenberger, Town of Nags Head's 50th Anniversary Committee Chairman, for his commitment to leadership, volunteerism, and support in the Town's 50th Anniversary Celebration, 1961 to 2011. His service is hereby recognized and valued. And John. Do you want to say something in 30 seconds? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I want you to call your committee up when, when, you, when right. you have your moment here. Well, let me, and let me do it this way. Uh, I stood in this position a lot of times for you a little award, you realize that it's really given to the guy at the top for the, everything that's been done by everybody that was down there. I said it once before when I got up here, I kind of hung on and tried not to get in the way of all the work and the activity going on below there, and that's the reason for the success. Um, not very many of them, I guess, were able to make it, but those that are here, I do want to get up. First off, Ms. Cookbook, Tara Downey, <laughs> a fantastic product that does honor to the town of Nags Head. It was not just a money maker, but it was a quality product that does honor to the town over a longer period of time. Sarah did this, and she deserves y'all's thanks. Certainly has mine. Now I've got Mike and Tina Adderholder here, steady workers all through the committee everything they were involved in up to it. And Jenny Jenkins on the art side, she was pretty much the driving force back to stand up here. Pretty much the driving <laughs> force on all of the artwork. And I think also, when it, since I don't have anybody else in the carnival side and the rest to talk about, I'm talking about Kevin. Your own Kevin that was in that. And just all the work he did, Ralph and his uh, facilities maintenance people, on that, and of course, Carolyn, who y'all really put down there to keep me straight. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I can't, I can't say how much good help I had from everybody. I certainly appreciate that. 
and the support from the town. So, thank Maybe you. if all of your committee members would stand up, we can give them yeah. a round, a of, round of applause. <laughs> Y'all do have our sincere thanks, and we, we certainly hope we can keep some of those traditions going. I, I kind of like that carnival idea every year, at least once a year. Um, the next item on our agenda is consideration of a taxi cab driver permit appeal. Chief? Good evening, Good evening Mayor, sir. Board of Commissioners. I know during our last meeting, the, uh, the board made an adjustment on the uh, taxi cab uh, ordinance, which uh, gave us some, a different latitude when looking uh, at factors to consider uh, whether before issuing a permit. That latitude had certainly helped. You notice that we had several appeals on last time. Um, they were all able to, to go through. However, I do have one that I was not able to send through. The one before you today, Ms. Veronica Barrett uh, applied for a renewal to her taxi cab license uh, operator's permit. And on June the 23rd of this year, I denied uh, that permit due to uh, item number 11, and it's due to uh, convictions. That's. Is she, is, is she here? Um, yeah. Ms. Uh, I would suggest you let her make her presentation, and then if you need further detail from Chief Brinkley, that you go to closed session and get the details on those convictions. Ms. Barrett, would you um, <coughs> care to come up and? Hi, thank you for your time. My name's Veronica Barrett. I've been a cab driver since 2003 on the beach. Um, recently, they've made some adjustments. Um, Kevin went over with my um, driving record with me. I haven't had any tickets in the last two years. Before that, I did have a few um, problems with speeding tickets and a couple of them were um, improper equipment. Since I started driving the cab, I've opened my own company here, which is Outer Banks Transportation. I have a taxi company and an airport service company as well. Um, I know there's several companies that are now in Nags Head that have been able to stay in business because of a grandfather clause where ordinances and stuff has changed, but because of the grandfather clause, they've been able to be considered to stay into business. Taxi cab is my business, and I guess that's kind of my hope that maybe, uh, I don't know the word to use, but that maybe I could be permitted to continue to have my taxi permit because I have been a cab driver and it was just recently changed. I have, like I said, I haven't had any tickets in a couple years. I know we need safe cab drivers on there and, and I understand that more now just as an owner of a company itself. And I've really been working on it since I had those problems and I, again, I haven't had any. Um, thank you for your time and if there's anything you need to know, I'd be more than happy to answer. I've got a question for Mr. Lighty. Yes, Is there a grandfathering on cab, cab driver permit? So all the current cab drivers have to, to meet these same criteria. Yeah, and I just, because I've been a cab driver continuously since 2003, I just thought maybe something, because the laws just changed. I mean, I was a cab driver when it happened, and I just, I didn't know if anything would fall under that to help me with this situation or not, or if it could be considered as an um, exception. I mean, I, I will tell you that the law changed, but the law loosened a little bit more yeah. than anything. Um, well, I've, I've had the same, I mean, I've, like I said, I've been a cab driver since 2003 and have my permit every year. This year it just changed and that's, you know, and I haven't had anything on my record for two years. So, and I think it goes back three, within three years you had the tickets, so. But thank you for your time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for coming. So would the board. Could I ask Kevin for clarification? Please. Yes, ma'am. Kevin, um, under, under which, um, Items is it that she it does, was, that she failed? It was under under the number eleven. It's uh, the convictions over a relevant over any relevant period of time. During the last meeting, I'll remove the the section of uh, specified number of years, and now we've done a relevant period of time, which allows me some latitude when looking at what time is relevant, and that's but, what I used in this case. So even though, like the mayor said, we lessen the restrictions, she still does not fall into um, the now current easier um, 
I guess, is what I'm looking for. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So she still does not fall into that category. In my in my opinion, no, ma'am. I was the the the. Uh, changing of the code that y'all did the last meeting certainly helps a, a, a great deal. It gives us some latitude, and I've tried to, to exercise that on, on the other applicants, which I was able to do with this particular one. I, I, I was not able to. Right, thank you. So what is your recommendation? I've known Miss Barrett uh, for a number of years since she's been driving a taxi. I think she's a, a good person, runs a reputable business, but unfortunately under our current code and the direction I've been given by the code, I'm, I'm not able to give a recommendation for her to retain her permit. Kelly. Okay. Okay. May I make a motion to go into closed session to get more pertinent information? Well, you want to kind of question chief first? I'll second. <laughs> and, and then that's to receive confidential information that can't be presented during the public meeting. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Did you want to ask a question on further Kevin, discussion? Kevin, I understand that she owns that business? She does. Okay. But that does not have anything to do with it. That has absolutely nothing to do she with it. She could con con continue. She continue to do business in the town. She just can't drive the cab. And pick up in the town of Nagsett. Yes, sir. But, but her employees can. Yes, sir. Further discussion on the motion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes unanimously. We're going to take a, a brief closed session. We will make it very brief. We're going to come back into open session, as promised, after a brief closed session. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board in this request for an appeal? It's, it's my understanding to our attorney that... that notwithstanding what we heard in there, that we don't have a choice. I mean, it has to be denied. So, move to deny. However, you know, as was, as was stated by the police chief, you can reevaluate, you know, at a, at a, uh, a time that could be, he can reevaluate as he deems it necessary for, uh, for the appeal process. Yeah, there so, is, there's nothing to, to say that she can't come back in over a period of time. She, she depending on what decision is made here tonight, she'll stay in contact with the police department and can come back in and she may take some other steps uh, to uh, ensure her, her safe driving. And if that's, that can certainly be considered. <clears throat> and so, so I mean, I, I don't, again, I, I just don't, we don't have any choice. Chief, it's, Chief is bound by our, uh, by our rules and regulations. And so therefore, we, I got a move for denial. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, ma'am. I will encourage you to come back after some time has passed. I will. The next item is item F, consideration of an amendment to the town code of ordinances section one through six, general penalty enforcement of ordinances. Sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Coming before you to, uh, today to try to make a, a slight change in our code of or ordinances, uh, chapter uh, one dash six, and it's the general penalty enforcement of ordinances. Uh, two chapters that the police department deals with most often are chapter six, which are animals, and chapter forty-six, which are vehicles for hire, which includes our limousines and taxis. Um, making that currently the the penalty for those two chapters are a civil penalty only. Uh, it does not allow a criminal penalty. Uh, the change that I'm asking for would enable officers to effectively enforce each chap these chapters by writing either a town civil citation or a North Carolina uniform citation, depending on the severity of the offense and or the number of past violations. By making this change, uh, we would also align both of these chapters with the North Carolina General Statute 14-4, which states that any person that commits a violation of town or city ordinance uh, shall be guilty of a, of a misdemeanor. So it's just a, a slight change that we're asking to come into alignment with that. And this also gives us the maximum number of enforcement tools to enforce the chapters for which we deal with most often. Question? Sir? Chief, this is done through the, uh, the attorney? Sir? You have, you have I've consulted contact. with the attorney in regards to this and the town manager. Okay. Um, and of course, I'm in favor of it. I'm, I move to adopt as presented. 
and then get a second and we can talk about it. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Chief, the purpose of this would be, as an example, if you had a loose dog and you gave the person a civil citation, and then maybe it happened again, you gave them, gave them again a civil citation, and, and, and this would open the door for a misdemeanor charge, which would go to district court. It would, sir. You won't see any changes. The, the police department uh, for many years has been operating under the, uh, under the guidelines of General Statute 14-4, which states that town ordinances are misdemeanors. This, is, this would not be a change in, in our operational procedures. If, you know, town codes typically get a town citation, depending on the severity of the offense or the, or the number of past violations, then you can certainly increase it to a state citation to, I think it, it gives us the maximum number of enforcement tools and, it, and gives us a little more teeth to the, to the enforcement, much like we did with the beach driving, or I'm sorry, the beach bulldozing last, uh, last meeting. But in giving, uh, in charging them with a misdemeanor, it goes to district court. It does. It would go before a district court judge. What I'm hearing is you're going to use discretion and not base it automatically. Y yes, ma'am. We've we we have exercised discretion each and every time. You you <clears throat> won't notice a change in the way we've done business. This is nothing more of a of a. An alignment thing to, to get us in comp uh, to align us with chapter uh, general statute 14-4 discretion will certainly be given and uh, allowing us to do both is 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 a great tool because start with a civil citation then you can increase if, if need be thank you yes ma'am for the discussion I totally agree with it. all those in favor of the motion please signify by saying aye aye, aye. all those opposed like sign Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Lighty? Uh, I would just like to report to the board that on Monday night we filed our motion for summary judgment in the San Soda case. Uh, our deadline for that motion was August the 15th, and we made our filing at that time. We filed both a motion for summary judgment as to all of the plaintiff's claims as well as to um, the counterclaims that we've asserted under the nuisance ordinance and for a common law nuisance and for the imposition of civil penalties. Uh, the other side has, of course, the right to respond to that motion, and then once that's been done, the matter will be referred to the court for ruling, and we don't know when that will be, but I just wanted to inform you all that that's the latest development in that litigation. Thank you, sir. And that's all I had for you all tonight. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Ogden. Okay. Um, first, I'll start off with the report on the beach nourishment. Um, as of today, the project is near 75% complete. Um, as of today, they have uh, pumped about 3.7 million cubic yards of sand onto the beach. So we're just under a million cubic yards left to put on the beach. Um, the, today, uh, staff and CSC, our engineer, accompanied, along with Great Lakes, accompanied two staff members from the Corps of Engineers out to the dredge and then onto the um, construction site. Uh, the Corps is extremely pleased. Um, they were uh, very appreciative of the steps that we've taken. They were uh, very complimentary of Great Lakes, of the safety, of the manner, the, the extra precautions that we've taken to ensure uh, not only compliance with the permit conditions, but also going a little bit above and beyond just to make sure that we're doing this right. Um, so they had nothing but positive comments. Uh, the board knows that the, the Texas, as of um, yesterday, as of yesterday morning, the Texas, the Cutterhead Dredge completed its project here. It's getting ready to, I don't know how long it takes for a, for a dredge to leave a site, but it's still here. It's still out in the water. It's not pumping anymore. Town attorney and I went down to the beach um, so he could kind of survey some of the work that's going on. They're breaking down the pipe um, that the Texas was working on and getting that pipe off the beach. Um, the Liberty Island is currently right at Islington Street. It's just um, south of Atterbanks Pier. Um, <coughs> it's going to fi finish up the, where where the, uh, the Texas had left off. It'll fill in that gap, uh, and then the lip, which should be done around the 21st or the 22nd. So we'll be done 
um, with the southern part of the project, except for that little bit that Texas still has to do. The Liberty will uh, then move to Enterprise Street, uh, right around um, Nags Head Inn, uh, and start pumping to the north while the uh, submerged line is being put down at the southern end, um, the Liberty will go back down to the southern end and finish that part of the project. Um, we are going to have the Dodge and the Padre. At one point, we thought they were coming, then they weren't, but now they are. Um, the Dodge should, will probably, um, once it passes off on all the safety and environmental inspections, the Dodge will be here Friday and start pumping. Uh, should start pumping and then um, the Padre will be closely there behind two or three days behind that um, and they're going to come in just south of the Nagshead Pier uh, and work their way north and then the Liberty and the Dodge and the they'll work together the Dodge and the Padres are the ones that kind of circle one another while one's offloading the other one's hopping up and they kind of work clockwise or counterclockwise um, and then after and then the Dodge and the Padre will meet up with the Liberty Island so that's kind of the schedule moving forward. Like I said, we got 25% left. Um, I think we're getting close back to being on schedule, finishing in, in mid-September. Um, so that, you know, we haven't had any more incidents, any more turtle um, findings on the beach. Um, all those turtles have been relocated in, to other areas of the county um, and things are, things are progressing along pretty well at this point. Any questions for Mr. Ogburn? One. Yes, um, Cliff, has, you say the end of the line that Texas has completed, it's gone all the way down and finished? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. The, uh, the Liberty is going to finish up that, that. word. The Texas, uh, the Texas just ran out of oomph. I don't <laughs> think that's the technical engineering word, but it just ran out of, of steam. So it became um, not very effective. Uh, and, and so it got to the point where the Liberty could do the job pr job production at a greater rate. So the Texas is going to move on to its next job site. Mm -hmm. So that that'll get that last section, um, the very small sections uh, south of Seagull down to the town line will be done um, after the Liberty gets done up here in the north and exit in. So that pretty much will be the last pretty part. Pretty much, yes, ma'am. And they, they try and complete the project somewhere in the middle because if, if they're done and they've got 4.5 million yards, it's easier to pump that last 100,000 yards in the middle than it is at the end because you exceed the boundary limits. You don't, you don't exceed it as much in the middle. Okay. okay. Um, the, the next thing I'd like to, um, with the beach drive, and we, we talked about it at the August 3rd meeting, staff has gotten together and what we'd like to propose is kind of a, a broader um, broader beach management plan, a neat beach management philosophy uh, or policy um, because it's more, this, this new beach has is, is, um, created new things that we need to look at. More than just beach driving, we need to be looking at the things on the items left on the beach overnight. We've already said no more beach bulldozing. Uh, we need to look at the sandbags and how we're going to proceed with those and whether or not we want to uh, follow what Duck has done and not allow sandbags to be put in Nags Head uh, moving forward. There, there's just, we got special events now that I think we're going to be facing with the possibility of having events on the beach that we haven't been faced with before because there just quite frankly wasn't any beach. Um, Public Works is looking at how they need to manage cleaning the beach and whether or not the trash cans are in the right location if the trash cans need to be moved in some places 200 feet closer to where the people are. So I think, I think we need to take a, a broad uh, look at all of the, the management and the, you know, how are we going to protect this public asset uh, moving forward. But I have some suggestions as it relates to beach, uh, beach driving. I, I want to um, be very clear that in no way am I suggesting that we ex uh, prohibit beach driving in the town of Nagshead. I, I do have a concern that we, 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 this is something that our folks have been able to enjoy and visitors have been able to enjoy. It's not been a problem. Um, people have been very, I think, respective of the beach. They've, they've dropped, dr driven carefully and, um, but at the same time, I, I want to, just like all these other issues, I want to make sure, I want to see us get a handle on some of these things and be able to manage them 
now, um, knowing that it could be coming down the road. Um, I've looked at the, the beach driving regulations. I've proposed some things in this memo that after further consultation with the uh, town attorney, we, we may need to, to look at some of these things may be challengeable, but what I think we need to make, one of the things we need to make clear is we talk about the type of vehicle and the type of tire that could do, do damage on the beach. Under eligible vehicles, I've, I've put uh, a sentence here that only USDOT approved tires with, with reduced air pressure will be allowed to operate on the beach. I stole that from the Park Service. That's one of the things that they're putting in. I, I checked with uh, Paul Stevens to see what they're doing and what type of regulation. DOT tires are street legal tires. What this does is it keeps somebody from coming onto the beach with the old type dune buggy with the airplane tires that you know with the that aren't that might be more damaging to the beach. And what they what he told me was the biggest issue and the biggest problem they have people not letting the tires out and then the holes and the ruts and the things that they leave. So that's why not letting the air out of the tire. Right, right. How you how you know that again? It's all part of some of this is education. You can't you can't enforce somebody not taking you, know, you can't ride down and see whether or not the air has come out it's an education thing a lot of this is trying to <coughs> educate folks on good beach courtesy i guess uh, and then going up from there the regulations the rules and operation at least if you can scroll up um, the way this is worded under number three vehicles must operate solely on that portion of the beach that lies within 20 feet west of the mean high water line very confusion to the common um, I have uh, have a much keener understanding of mean high water and so forth as going through the nuisance process. But my thought here was, if, if you go down to the south, south of Jeanette's Pier, the, the, the beach is so wide that there's a lot of room to drive between the dune and the ocean. And in order to um, best protect that area, I don't think it, the, the driving is in the middle of the beach is going to um, speed up erosion. But, but do we want to try and contain this driving um, to an area, to one area? Do we, we want to try and keep it away, obviously, from the dunes as much as we possibly can. But another way of saying this was the wet, the hard pack beach, riding along the area. The people that want to fish, that want to drive to the water, get close to the water, get out and fish, that's the area that I'm talking about, the, the hard, wet, the hard packed beach. Now, there's a much better way to say it than that. Um, but again, this is, partly for discussion purposes. That's in a nutshell what I was trying to get at. And then from there, um, here's the issue. The, we had talked about um, one of the, some of the things that we had kicked around, if you go on down to that next, oh, I'm sorry. I think I skipped. Presently, the speed limit on the beach is 25 miles per hour. Um, I think 20 miles per hour on the beach. In my neighborhood, in Naxit Acres, you can only drive 20 miles an hour in my neighborhood. So I, I kind of thinking, um, 20 miles per hour is probably, if it's sufficient for a residential neighborhood, it's probably sufficient for the beach. Um, and it's a safety thing, 20 miles. But again, police chief ain't gonna be out there with the radar gun, uh, we hope, because he's not going to need to. Um, but anyway, that's a common courtesy. You don't need to go more than 20. The approved beach push, that's just cleaning up the language. Vehicles won't be on the beach for, um, uh, for beach pushes because they're not allowed, so that's just Sim quite simply cleaning that up and taking that out. Um, and then if you'll go on down. We talked at the last meeting about diff this, could we, could we limit, um, could we protect the folks that have always been able to drive and um, kind of prohibit those that are coming down that may just be coming down as a weekend warrior that may not have our beach in the best interest. Um, I, I think that number 10 is probably gonna have to come out completely and another way of, of maybe uh, regulating or restricting is to put a number of permits that are issued. Um, maybe there's a maximum amount. I, I put 350 again as a starting point, which is probably an average for the last two years. But if you go into year three and four, probably looking at more like 450. Um, but again, I, I've tried to capture some of the things that the board talked about at the last meeting while not being prohibitive, but just trying to get out ahead of what might come. Questions for Mr. Ogden? If, if not, I'm gonna give folks yeah. a chance to, to talk if that's all right. That um, right. Please, if you would, come up and uh, give your name and your address and we'd love to hear your comments.
Y'all hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is John Newbold. I live in uh, Nags Head Acres, right around the corner from you, sir. <laughs> I've got a couple of problems with some of these uh, issues that you've written down and read, whoever, whoever added those issues. Um, the Park Service, in their infinite wisdom, <laughs> not only controls tires, they control bird species. I don't want to get into a big deal, but they block off hundreds and hundreds of feet of beach for birds that the state of Virginia, by the way, is killing because of the bridge tunnel system to the Eastern Shore. Um, what they're trying to do is, if you want to eliminate cleated tires, do so. The best, the best tires you can drive on a beach are airplane tires. They don't have any tread. They're soft. Back in the 60s, I've, I have driven from Sandbridge all the way down here in a two-wheel drive car with airplane tires. So the key is to get rid of the heavy treaded tires that you'd use up in the mud, and, and that would be okay if that was the language. The second portion, vehicles must operate solely on the area 20 feet west of the mean high tide line. What you're doing is taking the vehicles away from the easy place to drive, which is on the east side where the sand is damp. Now you're forcing the vehicles to go up on the dry portion of the beach, which will make it more ruddy. And in the time of year that we drive, the tourists tend to be up on that portion of the beach. They're not down next to the water. It would be much, make much better sense if we drove east of the high tide line, not west. The speed limit part is fine. 20 is fine, in my opinion. The only issue permits to Dare County property owners uh, is going to cause a problem. I work for a bait and tackle store, and we sell probably as many permits as the city does. Uh, to put a limit on the permits, I think, is unnecessary. Many of the out-of-state people who come do it around tournament time, and they pay the same price I do, $25. I'll use the beach all winter. They may go two or three times. We're aiding and abetting the, uh, the problem that tourists perceive already down here. There's a lot of animosity towards the Park Service, and we don't need to jump in the same bed with them by limiting and reducing beach access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Newbold. Uh, Gary Oliver out of Banks Pier. Uh, I don't know if y'all remember the bluefish blitzes of the 70s. People didn't even know where Nags Head was. And the tourism, the people, we were on the map because of bluefish. There wasn't Weather Channel in. We didn't have a lot of money in the Tourist Bureau or the Chamber of Commerce. The bluefish put us on the map. And people drove the beach, and, and uh, it's been a tradition there for forever and ever. If you're worried about the number of people, raise the price a little bit. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cut out the weekend wars. Uh, it'll, it'll lower probably the number of people who use it. But people who really want to use it will pay more, I will. Uh, but that could be a way of, of starting to uh, see how many permits we want. We've got a big beach now. It's, uh, uh, we just need to find out what we've got. Right now, a lot of people don't use it. And just remember, we don't start you driving the beach till October. And we're off the beach uh, at the end of April. So most of the time that we're on the beach, uh, there aren't a lot of people around. And anyway, I just hope you all consider that. And don't hurt us too much on beach driving. Thank you, sir. My name is Ronnie Scott. I uh, want to say that this beach driving, I sat on that board years ago when we created beach driving in Nags Head. We had a public hearing of all the people that didn't want it and all the ones that did want it. We had hundreds and hundreds of people come there and we discussed it and we took notes. We went back and said, okay, what is the problem? Well, this one of the problems was the taxpayers are paying for the money for us to go over and so forth. 
So I said, well, what can we do? I said, maybe get a permit and charge the people to drive on the beach. That will help fray some of the expense plus the grant money. And through discussions, we came up with that. Well, I bought the first permit, and I still have the first permit. So in other words, some of these changes, this ordinance was worked on. The original was worked on by a lot of people. We put a lot of thought in it to protect the beach in Nags Head. Nags Head is a, a special entity. We've had ordinance come up with other municipalities and even the county has not had. We've always led the way. A lot of the people this beach nourishment, I worked very hard to get it, and a lot of them said, will I be able to drive my vehicle on that beach when we have beach nourishment? I said, yes, you will. And then she, they said, well, I'm for it then, I'm for it. Well, <clears throat> some of the things here, right here that I'm looking at, uh, the tires, all fishermen are different breed. Fishermen are not like the weekend warriors that come down at Oregon and then they do all the wheelies and they don't fish, half the people. Fishermen are good people and they respect the rules and regulations. Now, all of them, the first thing you do, I've been the head judge for the National Surf Fishing Club for going on 31 years. And all, I have something like 20 some judges and scores. And, and all the, <clears throat> the captains, all the teams, I say, look, first thing you do, you let you ride your tires, you respect the dunes and you do this. And as far as my, I'm concerned, I, we've never had a problem. Now, as far as the 20 feet that goes to the west like that, that's ridiculous. You can't even park a vehicle this way and have a judges and scores and all of the vehicles go that way. There's no way in hell. Now, what we did back when we did this ordinance, so many feet from the toe of the dune, and you're protecting the dunes. That's the main thing. We spent all this money to do beach nourishment, and it's a public domain, we want everybody to enjoy it. We want the, the, the people that go there to swim and put their umbrellas out, and we want the people that fish at, in October in the winter times to enjoy it also. Now, we can't say that only certain people can do that and make it so restrictive that, that they can't do it. In 2010, there was 350 permits sold. In 2011, there was 371 permits sold. Now, most of those didn't drive the beach every day. They didn't go out there and fishermen don't stake this stuff out and do all this stuff like they do at Oregon Inlet. Like I saw a gentleman here was showing Oregon Inlet with all the, all the stuff. That's not the way Nags say it is. And we need to control it. And I think what we have right now, the ordinances, it's always all these years been perfect. I don't know, and maybe Kevin can tell you if we ever had a problem. Have you had any problems out there? Or maybe a couple, a few, you're going to have some. But the issue is that that's a police issue if somebody breaks the law with the ordinance we have. So I don't know. Am I, <clears throat> issues do come up. There are problems at, at times, and we're, we will address those as they, as they come up, whether it's under this ordinance or a new one that the board decides on. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Scott. Anybody else care to speak on beach driving? <clears throat> Discussion among the board? I don't, I don't mind leading off. This is a... You're a nail, go ahead. It's like dogs on the beach a little bit. <laughs> That's um, bring dogs no, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> believe me. Um, the the one piece in here that I think we that I could could live with is that reduction of speed from 25 to 20, and I, I didn't really hear any objections from any of y'all. I think anybody that's out there, we are. Uh, I think we had a very far-seeing board when this was done, and if if the Park Service had done what we did 20, 30 years ago, they wouldn't have the problems that they have today. Um, our permit system has, has worked well through an awful long time. Um, and I think it, forcing people to, to jump through that hoop gets you away from the folks that are just down there to tear it up. And we, we've had good citizens and, and people that re do respect the beach and uh, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with where we are. I, I appreciate the effort at, at trying to bring things together. We, we kind of let Cliff 
out there to run up the straw man, and the straw man got a little shot. Um, it's my job. <laughs> yes, sir, it is. Um, I, I think that vehicle's operating within that portion of the beach. I think you were talking about kind of from the edge of the water up 20 feet, and I, right. I understand what you're saying. Um, I think we should probably wait, though, and see whether we have issues with that or not. Um, and I'll be quiet with that. Ma'am? Mayor, I was talking to somebody yesterday, Pat Preston, that rides on the beach a lot. And he made what I thought was a very insightful suggestion, which was that we form a beach, advise, beach driving advisory committee made up of people that drive on the beach that can work with the police chief and the manager to discuss issues and advise the board on how to deal with those issues. I thought that was a great idea. Um, as far as this goes, I can live with a 20. I think the perception that we were trying to stop beach driving was entirely wrong. I don't think anybody intended that. I think we need to clarify that. Um, I also believe that I understand what the manager was trying to say, but it really as many discussions as we've had about mean high water, I don't think we need to continue that discussion. I mean, that's been an issue for a long time with East North so I just don't think that that's... You didn't say what you meant to say, in other words, but I'm comfortable right now to make a couple changes, such as the um, speed limit, but I would like to see us take a step further and involve those people that use the beach in our development of it goals and ordinances. Sir? A few comments. Uh, I agree with Mr. Newbold and uh, Ronnie. Uh, the best place to drive on our beach is at low tide in the wet sand. You can drive a car there. I drove many automobiles on the wet beach at low tide. When you go down on that beach at high tide and try to drive on the wet beach, you got a problem. It's not a place to drive. When you use the high water mark as a guideline for beach driving, there's no one in town hall can go down there tomorrow morning and show you the high water mark. We've discussed it too many times. It's uh, no one knows where it is. We know we've got one, but we don't, nobody can find it, so we can't use that. Uh, 20 miles an hour is fast enough on the beach. Uh, <coughs> I brought this to the board three or four meetings ago, and my only concern with beach driving is these trucks coming down from out of state that's tearing up our beach, not our beach in Axia. But down on Coquina Beach this summer, where the Park Service allowed you to drive, it was packed with these big trucks. And they come down there, they don't slack their tires. If they do, they drive <coughs> over the sand. If they slack their tires, they get stuck, and that's what they want to do is get stuck. And that's the, their program. And we don't need that on our beach in Nags Head, and we better be ready to handle it. We haven't had that problem in the past because we've had no beach. Now, there's one thing, one September or Labor Day, there's not that many trucks around. They're back to college. Uh, the Nags Head Fishing Tournament is not a problem. Never have been a problem. Uh, people eat, uh, like I think Mr. Newbold said, people that go down there to fish, are not, or Ronnie, I think, people that go down there to fish are not a problem. They don't, they don't drive on our hills. They, uh, they don't molest our beach. And really there, we have no problem. My only concern are these trucks, the way they have tore up the beach down south of Kukina Beach this year, and on down on Harris Island. Uh, As far as permits go, I think we, we really need to wait and see what kind of problems we have before we uh, address the permit issue. Uh, <clears throat> I think we'll have more driving on the beach now because we have a better beach. Where in the past, a lot of our beach was closed during driving season because there was no beach. But I, I think our driving rules are good. Uh, there's enough beach. I don't think you have to put driving lanes down. I think there's enough beach where you can drive in where you want to go. And, and like I said, uh, as far as the tournament goes and people going down there fishing, they respect their beach. We've never had a problem with them. Thank, Thank you, sir. 
Commissioner. Uh, for the sake of a, I'm not, I'm not in favor of changing things just for the sake of changing. The ordinances that, that, that former Commissioner Scott talked about have been in place, they worked well for us. If you want to reduce it to 20 miles an hour, I mean, I, I don't know that we've had a big speeding issue on the beach, but if you want to reduce it, that's fine, I can live with that. Leave, it, leave the rest of it in place, evaluate you know, after the uh, beach nourishment is done, see how we come out, and then go from there. I don't, I don't see, I certainly don't see limiting the number of permits. I see the uh, an enforcement issue with the police department that's, that uh, that we always have had in place and we need will need in the future. Other than that, you know, it's been good in the past. It's going to be better now because we have a better beach. I don't have an issue with it. But if you want to reduce the 20 miles an hour, that's fine. Everything else can stay in place. Well, thank you for allowing me to be last. And I've said before, I'll say it again, it isn't broken, don't fix it. Um, I agree that I don't think people drive 25 miles an hour anyway, so lower it to 20, I still don't think they'll drive <coughs> that fast. Um, as far as driving on the beach, once a track is laid, usually people will follow that track and fishermen try to get as close to the water because that's the hard packed sand um, as they can. But I will say this, Wayne, the fishermen are not going to fish at low tide. When the tide's coming in, that's when they're going to be there because usually um, the incoming tide brings fish. So, but still, they're going to be close to the water's edge. They're not going to be driving up 50 feet, parking their vehicle and, dry, and walking 50 feet to, to surf fish. They're not going to do it. Uh, as far as, why do you not drive on the beach a lot in the winter? Because we have time to fish. I cannot remember a time that I have seen anyone disrespectful of the beach. Now, I am sure it's happened. I'm sure it's happened. And I have fished many years in the tournament that Ronnie's talking about, and I judge every year since I quit fishing. I, I just, there's not a problem. And I appreciate Cliff's work on this. I appreciate Cliff and I trying to explain to several people what you meant by, you know, we don't expect you to walk 200 yards <laughs> with your tackle box. Um, but the Dare County people know what Nags Head has been through to get sand on that beach. And thank goodness for Dare County commissioners because, again, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have it. So I think there's a new um, level of respect that will be shown on that beach. And I would like to, Renee has a good idea about an advisory committee, but I'd, I'd like to even postpone that until we really are in need of another advisory committee. If that, if we find out this winter, um, from October 1st to April 30th, that we have a real problem, I am sure Kevin will let us know. And at that time, we may have to take um, future steps to to rectify whatever the problem is. But I say leave it alone. Lower the speed limit and, and just leave it alone. I don't mind using two tiers if, if you feel like that Dare County residents and Nags Head taxpayers could pay one fee and all of the others um, double that fee. If you feel that that would maybe prevent some of the lesser caring people, um, if we see that we need that, I, I think that might be one way to maybe call out the weekend warrior. Uh, so again, there, there, I think there's a lot of ways that we can go about fixing the problem if it occurs. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The board care to take any action on this this evening? Uh, I didn't hear any consensus on doing that. Um, I, I think asking our, our local folks that do, are out there on the beach, Mr. Newbold, those kind of folks, uh, to keep an eye open this, this winter and see if we do have problems. And I think it's, large, it's somewhat self-policing. Uh, th mm -hmm. those, those folks that don't respect the beach, I think, are going to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, do you, uh, would you like to consider lowering the speed limit? Um, 
that that's the one piece that I did hear some consensus on, but I don't know that it's pressing on that either. Um, I think the you're, you're limited why, on. Why don't we evaluate? Why don't we evaluate the reduction of speed? You know, after this season, after, or after the make decision then instead of just reducing it for the same reducing. Okay. Does that suit everybody? Yeah. So we'll meet again um, first May. <laughs> we'll hear back from the winter how the winter fishing season was. Yeah. You know, okay. my, my only concern when I brought this to the board was the trucks I'm telling you about. I've been down in the middle of them as a law enforcement officer. I've seen them. I've stopped them. I've been there for days, and, and it happens. And, and I, I wanted the board to be ready if it happened in Nags Head. And I'll tell you, Anna, people do fish at low tide. There's been an unwritten rule on the beach that when you're driving on the wash at low tide and you run with the fishermen, you go around him. You drive up on the bank of the beach, you go around him. And that's been forever. But people do fish at low tide. Thank you all very much for, for coming out this evening. We do appreciate a lot of hard work and a lot of years of experience in fishing. Um, but thank you for, for coming out and sharing your, your opinions with us, too. Uh, we're not going off half-cocked. Mr. Ogburn? Uh, Still your agenda, sir. Monopole. Um, we've got Mr. Fabricant here. Uh, he represents a company that's presented, I gave to you at your last meeting, um, a company, AP Wireless Infrastructure Partners, who has presented you with a proposal, two proposals, one to take over the leases that we presently have, and we do have one cell lease on top of the water tower down in South Max Head, and then, the, and then three here. Um, and in addition to that, the proposal includes the outright purchase of the monopole. Um, we've reviewed uh, some of the previous agreements as far as what needs to be done with the present leaseholder and the, uh, um, with AT&T with the monopole. We, there's some first rights refusal that we have to negotiate and some conditions upon which uh, this a sale or a transfer of the lease would be contingent on. But I think the thing that the board needs to decide is whether or not you want to go forward with either one of these proposals. And I'll ask Mr. Fabricant to come forward and uh, tell you about the proposals. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Marvin Fabricant. I live in Kill Devil Hills. I have a business office in Kill Devil Hills. I um, <coughs> um, own property in Nags Head and Kill Devil Hills. I serve on the planning board at uh, Kill Devil Hills. I am a licensed uh, attorney in Maryland, and I am also a licensed real estate broker down here. Uh, initially, let me say that I want to thank uh, Cliff uh, Ogburn and John Lee for their kind cooperation in this process. And uh, the main item for decision uh, for you all uh, to consider is this. You have a source of income uh, that is represented in the lease income that you receive every month from both the monopole and the water towers. <laughs> My client, who is based in Boston and California, is interested in acquiring that stream of income. And essentially what happens is, and John, the legal form of the transaction uh, can take many shapes, but basically, the town gets out of the business of leasing uh, to cell tower uh, to cell carriers, AT and T, Nextel, whatever, and my client assumes the risks, the business risks, that there are mergers, bankruptcies, uh, renegotiation of leases, uh, and those. Uh, assumptions of liability, in, in my judgment, 
pale to the overriding uh, liability they assume, which is what I call technological obsolescence. I'm old enough, and I think some of you are old enough, to remember 45 RPM records and those big cell phone, uh, big phones that you would carry around to uh, call any place in the world, and yeah, all kinds of different things. And none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And my clients have faith that uh, that technology will not overstrip them. And with all due respect, and I've told them to their face that, you know, that's fine. They can assume the risk. But as a citizen of this county and as a citizen of uh, Kill Level Hills, I suggest that that's a risk that the city ought to be, be grateful to get rid of. Uh, burn the hand. Um, and I think whether the deal is done with the company that I represent or whether it's uh, done with a competing company, and I haven't seen the offer, I think the deal should happen. Um, the analysis generally employed is to take the lease amount and uh, do what they call a net present value, which is simply taking the length of the term which my clients want, which is 30 years primarily, and saying, well, <laughs> that stream of income would give us X. And in today's dollars, it's worth Y. Well, <laughs> that's, in my judgment, based on a very faulty initial uh, premise. And that is that this same technology is going to be viable in 30 years, much less than three years. Uh, people like my children, who are much more savvy with the technological age than I am, tell me that the body of human knowledge doubles every three years. And I suggest that uh, those 50 North Carolina power telephone poles that are up every, seems like, 20 feet uh, could tomorrow be taken over by AT&T or Nextel or whatever and say, you know, we can put a little bird nest on top of that. See you later. Um, I think uh, it's a um, decision that is hinged on uh, getting a secure stream of income now in, a, in the form of a lump sum payment, which and again, I haven't seen the other offer, but I think ours is, or my client's is uh, pretty uh, astounding. Uh, and being able to use that money, either initially or over a number of years, or budgeting it. Um, and that's, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's really the, uh, the gist of it. You have one question. Question, yes, sir. What would your company do? What, what, uh, what's your goal with the tower? I mean, come in and maintain it as we, as we do. No, uh, Mr. Gay, what they would do is simply assume the position that you're in. They would become landlords for that leasehold interest, which is represented by that lease. Whatever your rights and responsibilities are, in the assignment of that, they get those same rights and responsibilities. Um, the end game for them is they are a huge, uh, hugely funded operation, uh, and they hope to uh, gather and control of not two or five leases, but thousands of leases, and they're on the way to do that. And they have a view that they can um, securitize them or do whatever they do on Wall Street with these things. The point being that if you lost three of those leases tomorrow for whatever reason, uh, that I think would have some in financial impact on you. For them, it has little or none. They're prepared to take that risk. Uh, I'm, did that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir, you did. Thank you. Other questions? I have a, I have a couple actually. Sure. On 
One of the options was a loan secured by lease receivables. Can yes. you help me understand that a little bit better? Yeah. That, that involved a, a higher payment to us, so that yes. sparks my interest. Uh, and this, uh, John, uh, bear, uh, jump in if you think I'm misstating anything, but basically the difference between the first two proposals and that the third one is, under the first one, you are actually assigning the lease. You sign a document, my people got the lease. Under the second, or under what you just asked about, my company makes a loan to the city. The loan is secured by those leases. Uh, it's a slightly different structure, yields more money, uh, but that's the essential difference between secured by leases as opposed to the assignment of the leases. And is there a, a greater liability for the town on that? Uh, I don't believe so. For us or? Uh, I, I, I would defer to uh, John or, or, or your council, but I don't believe there's any um, greater uh, liability. Um, there are nuances to this, Mr. Mayor, that um, I know a little bit about, and you know what they say about a little bit of knowledge. Um, there are ways to structure the transaction. For instance, if you match fund it, if you need a fire truck, or you want to build a firehouse, or you want whatever, the community center uh, that the lady spoke about earlier, there are ways that the transaction yields even more money for the city and greater benefit for my client. The initial determination is whether or not you want to, uh, to sell it. And I think the prudent course, I believe, is to look at it. You don't have to make a commitment like I told Cliff from day one. And by the way, Cliff was good enough to meet with me twice and my client and myself once, uh, and I appreciate that. But nothing is uh, is lost by looking into the possibility, and you can always deny it. Uh, but I think it's something that should be looked into. Uh, it is a matter of uh, potentially great reward for the uh, citizens, um, and you, I don't think you want to be in a position in two or three or five years or 10 years, where the asset has been outstripped by laser technology or, you know, satellites or atomic. I mean, your, your imagination only limits you as to what can happen. Um, but obviously, my clients are betting the other way. There was some language in there about future additional leases and a, and a shared split on those. Was that just on, and I guess just to make sure that you understand, we don't own the land under the water tower down in South Nanks Head, where we do own the land under the, the tower here. Right. But there was some. Uh, yeah, the way that works, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but the way that works is if my clients take over the leasing and you're assigned you assign the leases to them. If the city independently comes up with another user, you get 100% of that income. That's yours. If my client comes up with a user, you get 75%. They keep 25%. <clears throat> Is, I, I believe we are subject to the upset bid process on selling the, the tower that we have. Is that an issue for your for your client? They would be willing to participate? We, we don't have a choice, I don't believe. Well, um, I think so far as my client is concerned, you know, they want the transaction to happen, and they will do what whatever the circumstances dictate. Uh, as a legal matter, and again, I'll defer, uh, I'm not so sure it is required, Mr. Mayor, because if you are dealing other than real estate, if you're dealing with a lease or an easement or a right, something that is really personal property, not real property, my understanding is that it may not be subject to that. I'm not suggesting under any circumstances that you should accept a bid blind without some basis of comparison, some basis of making sure it's fair. 
But uh, I think the time issue is the main detraction of the uh, RFP. Um, but certainly there are uh, half a dozen companies out there that with a phone call, you can probably get an idea whether or not this is a fair proposal. Um, but, you know, again, that's, you're in the driver's seat. Whatever you all want to do, they will uh, attempt to accommodate you. Sorry, I didn't mean to monopolize. No, no I just have one. Um, Mr. Fabricant, does your client own um, cell tower assets nearby? Uh, they have none in North Carolina. They have, uh, and I'm sort of new to it also, the genesis of all this is that my friend who is part of the AP, which is the Associated Partners, was visiting me and my wife in uh, Cut Level Hills. And he is somebody who has invested or thought about investing with me in real estate stuff. And he saw the tower and he said, that's what we're into now. I'd like to buy the tower. Um, they have most of their operation in California. Um, they have an office in Boston. My immediate contact is in um, uh, Connecticut. Uh, Cliff Ogburn and I met with that company's representative who is actually based in Connecticut as well. But to answer your question, no, they don't have any in North Carolina. And any particular reason that they chose next other than just driving by and saying, I want to buy that tower? Yeah, that was really it. And. You know, I am in business down here. Uh, they felt that um, it would be a good opportunity to test this market based on, you know, my knowledge of the area. Um, and that's sort of way it happened, happened since. Um, and I think uh, it's just, that's the way it happened. I mean, uh, they are anxious and have tasked me with um, pursuing other opportunities. Uh, but I actually started in Kill Level Hills because that's where I live and work. And uh, then um, this was my second stop. Um, so that's where it wound up. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Anybody? I mean, my, my sense of it is you're looking at slightly over a million dollars, a uh, million sixty four thousand. Uh, with those, with the two items together, and uh, that versus a stream of income over the next 30 years uh, is the alternative to that. Um, you've got to look and see what you can use that million dollars for that might generate something better for the town. Um, and also, it's not really a core business of the town. I mean, providing cell service or cell towers is not really what I see is our, our core function, not a core governmental function. And our um, annual cell tower income is what is it, 84000 84, so, so it would leave a hole in the budget well, in that amount. And that's why, you know, I toyed with this just to, just to discuss and turn it over. When you, when you plug in the 83000 every year as an income for your budget, <coughs> versus taking a million one-time opportunity. Um, you can recoup, assuming that you still have the same users in 10 years, um, or 12 years it would be, what you have sold it for. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed what you just said. You said how? Well, if you get 83. Right, right, I got okay, that. And then so in 12 years, right. you would have we would have gotten the million, whatever. We would have, we would be at the purchase price, where you would still have, um, you know, 18 years left, to, assuming you're still getting the same amount of money. I, I'm just trying. I've been trying since I read, since I read this interesting piece twice, to figure out, you know, does you you take a chance of the loss of the users, take. A, chance of the, of the laser technology doing away with it. But then your client is no, is no, um, 
he, I don't think he's where he is today by purchasing, losing businesses. Um, so he must have some idea that things will produce no him money. It. No, I mean, obviously he's in yeah. business and they believe they're willing to take that risk. That risk. Um, but it's interesting. It's not only, I mean, I know of situations and Cliff, I don't know whether that happened here where uh, a cell tower user tried to renegotiate downward. Uh, I know of a case, I believe it's AT&T taking over T-Mobile where those two leases will become one. Mm -hmm. And my clients told me they've been burned. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, they're in business. They're betting the other way. Right. It's sort of like being at a poker table and getting insurance. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really a risk and the burden of hand and all that other stuff. But it's one thing to be to have that risk of losing two leases when you've got four leases. It's another thing to have that risk when you've got a thousand leases. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly a, a different scenario there. Um, but you know, in five years we lose it all. As technology advances, it may not be a use for a tower. And let's face it, a million dollars today is going to be is worth more than a million dollars ten years from now, ma'am. Mayor, I think this is an interesting proposal. I think we've also, I guess, expect a proposal from Capital Communications Capital Group. I haven't seen that. I haven't we seen haven't either. Oh, okay. I would suggest that none of us here at the table have total expertise in this, or even limited expertise in this. I would like us to contact the league and find out other area, other municipalities or counties in North Carolina that have had this experience. And if so, get some information on it before we make a quick decision. And I'm happy to help any way I can. Um, I have, uh, at their request, done some inquiries other places. I'm here, happy to share that, whatever my experience has been. And it's been very varied. Um, but in many cases, uh, cities have never been contacted before. In many cases, they have. Um, so it's really sort of all over the board. But um, for instance, in Kill Devil Hills, um, and by the way, they sort of took that same approach. Renee, they are sort of looking for expert advice to find out. A second offer did come in after my clients. And it was from another company. And while it was a little bit of apples to oranges, they weren't that far off dollar-wise that gave them you know, some comfort that um, the initial proposal was, was good, but that's certainly reasonable and I think we can help any way we can. And I, I will tell you that I did on, on, on your suggestion from this afternoon called the league um, and actually talked to, to Ellis Hankins. They have not had a lot of experience. They had a little flurry of activity several years ago, I think, but they haven't had much recent experience. We may have to look for other other resources there to, to call on, which I'm, I'm sure there are some out there. And maybe the counties, county association can help us possibly as well. I would also um, like, since we're going to go that route, I'd like to ask John to, um, he brought up a very important point that perhaps this would not have to go out for upset bid. I, I, I think we need to make sure that we do or we don't if we're going to consider selling it all. I would like to comment on that. Um, Mr. Fabricant did mention that, and I've, I've looked into this. My partner, Brock Mitchell, has looked into it as well. Uh, we believe that the uh, board is authorized to enter into a transaction to sell its rights to the tower. However, um, the sale of the tower that the, that the town owns would have to be treated as a sale of personal, a uh, real property. <clears throat> the sale of the tower that you simply uh, have, have rights to and don't own the dirt for. But it is a leasehold, but it's a lease for more than 10 years. It all, Any lease for more than 10 years is treated as a sale of real estate. Just like Brit Haven. Just, just like Brit Haven. And for either one of those, you would not be allowed to use private negotiation and sale. For either one, you would have to use advertisement for sealed bids or a negotiated offer, but then an advertisement and upset bid process following. So we think that would be required, even for the one that's a leasehold. Any further questions? Sir? Or public auction. Yes, sir. Public auction. 
Any further questions for Mr. Fabrica? Thank you very much. I think we're going to take it under advisement and yeah, listen, good. look for, yes. ju judge all the offers together and get a little more information if we can. Yes. Okay. Oh. Mr. Auburn? One more thing. Um, we have talked about in years past uh, trying to get a, a power supply to the uh, maintenance shed at the Public Works debris yard. Um, we've got a proposal. I'm going to ask Ralph to back me up on this, but we've got a proposal. Uh, we got the price from Dominion Power, what it would cost to establish the power there. It's $5,104 and one penny. Um, and I'd like, we'd like to go ahead and get this done because of the, uh, the elements and the conditions and what, it would provide a spotlight. Uh, it would provide lighting for the site, which we presently don't have. That helps the, the, uh, sanitation employees that this time of year when they're there, uh, work and unload and load and it's dark. So it would help them as well as trying to get some, uh, air and heat, heat and cool and heat the building. So the, uh, the employees that are working there will have some relief. So we'd like to uh, ask the board to authorize us to enter into this. Uh, Everybody have a chance to review that proposal? Okay. Uh, what's the pleasure of the board? I move that we authorize the um, town managers to go forth with this, get, get that power out there. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Sure. We have a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes unanimously. I think um, you, I think Cliff has one more item. Same things. Yes. Um, <laughs> as part of that, the beach, you know, looking at the bigger picture of the beach nourishment, we really have got to, if you ride the beach, um, especially in there where we haven't had dunes, we, we really need to um, protect uh, what's there and, and be able to, we've talked about taking the sand fence and money that we have and be able to um, line that 9,000 feet of, of beach that doesn't presently have sand fence so that we can start to build some dunes. Um, I've asked two things. One, Dave's got some, the past history and he can talk about how much, you know, we're going to have about 50,000 and how much of that 9,000 feet we can get sand fence in front of. But also I've asked uh, Dave Clark and Elizabeth Teague to kind of put their heads together with Camla to offer to our uh, property owners uh, a workshop on a weekend, um, maybe sometimes after Labor Day or later into the fall when, when uh, property owners are using their cottage a little bit more and show them the proper way of doing this. And take it a little bit further, not just the sand fence, but what type of vegetation will work so we can start to educate people to build up the dune in front of their property. So I, if you've got anything to add. Um, as the board knows, the interest on the sand tax funds that the county collected for six months several years ago has been distributed for three years, actually four years, to the communities that applied for it. We did not take any money this past spring because of beach nourishment. We didn't want to put sand fencing out that ultimately could get covered by the new beach. So we'll have about $49,500 quote unquote in the bank this fall that we can use for putting sand fence on the beach. Now reach three, which was the section of the beach nourishment project that was originally designed to get dunes, but because our beach had accreted by over 400,000 cubic yards of sand between last November and May when nourishment started, the beach was wider and they ended up putting sand on the beach, but not building the dune. That 9,000 linear feet at about $32 per 10 feet, which is an average price for the three years that we did the sand fencing project, would take up about $29,000. So we can easily put sand fencing in the entire 9,000 feet of Reach 3. In addition to that, though, we'll have funds available, uh, about another uh, $20,000 that can be used. And as we've done in the past, we have a form on the town's website. If you go to the town website and you look under news and information, you can click on a link that'll take you to the one page form that is both a request form and, and basically it's an easement document. But now since with beach nourishment, I believe that we will be able to easily put the sand fence in that 9,000 feet of reach three without getting a new easement from all the property owners because we've already had an easement for work on the beach for the beach nourishment project. But we have several people who have applied uh, since a year and a half ago when the last time we put sand fencing on the beach. So we do have other folks who applied and we'll take them, uh, you know, in, in past years, we 
we had a problem in South Nags Head because much of South Nags Head, even though the property owners applied, they weren't able to get sand fence because there was no dry sand beach. And coastal management regulations require that you, or prohibit you, let me put it that way, from putting sand fence on wet sand beach. That won't be a problem this year. So we'll be able to treat just about anywhere in South Nags Head, even outside of Reach 3, for property owners who request that we, we do so. So I would encourage anyone who has not submitted an application to the town who would like sand fence to do so. If they have submitted one in years past and they're not sure if it's still valid or if we still have it on file, I encourage them to submit a new one as well. It's the same form. If it's on file, we'll still honor it as we have had in the past when we had more applications than we could put sand fence on. But now this year we've got Again, we've got more funds and we should be able to do, a, by my estimate, almost three miles worth of sand fencing in total based upon the funds that we have available. Um, as the manager said, he has um, asked Elizabeth and myself to put together uh, some workshop. Actually, she and I were talking just before the meeting and we probably will do maybe more than one on a Saturday and maybe one in an evening. Uh, She's had some indication from Jeanette's peer that provided scheduling would work out. We could use the, the room that the gala was held in, which is probably one of the largest meeting rooms, even larger than the south wing of Station 16 across the street, to, to allow for as many people as possible. I know that there are some homeowners associations that meet in the fall in some of the areas in town. I'm gonna to be contacting some of the rental agencies tomorrow that manage these particular sections of town to find out when those people may be in town. And maybe we can schedule, not in conflict with, but on the same day as they have their homeowners meetings, a meeting to discuss the various options that are available. Of course, in addition to sand fencing, American beach grass is, is a, an excellent tool. And I was looking online today and getting information about it to try to get some cost estimates and how you put it in. Uh, we have not used these beach nourishment funds that we have gotten from the, uh, the county in the past to do beach sprigging because we still had a demand for sand fencing. And even though the costs are roughly the same for a 50 foot lot for sprigging versus sand fencing, the labor costs to install it are much more expensive for the sprigging. So we've tried to get as much bang for our buck as we have had as we could in previous years by installing sand fencing. And, it's, and again, there's a, a demand for it certainly in that reach three and other areas. But we'll certainly look in the past, I believe the town has been able to, to get some limited quantities of, of beach grass that we made available to citizens, but maybe by working out a, a, a bulk buy, we could get a better price. The citizens would pay for it, but they wouldn't pay as much as they would if they went individually to a, a, a nearby turf farm or a nursery to buy it just on their own, just enough for their property. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that the board members may have. Questions for Mr. Clark? Yeah, I got a question. Dave. Yes, sir. Down south, uh, south of the Outer Banks Pier, the beach is gonna be 100 yards wide. How are we going to sand fence that? Well, what we'll do, um, we've already had discussions with Coastal Science and Engineering, our engineer, and we will, we will locate the sand fencing that we put in Reach 3 in the area where the dune would have been built where there is no dune now. So we'll start to create a dune that will be in line with dunes that currently exist to the north of Reach 3 to try to start creating that dune line. Uh, again, I mean, obviously, we don't want to create it too far out on the beach because that's the area that is used by the public, but we want to start to build a dune back up where it's been taken away by storms in the past because there was no beach to protect it. Now we'll have a large beach in front of it that will protect the dune as it's being built by sand fence and then later on by sprigging. So what we're going to do is start at the dune and build toward the ocean. That's right. But we'll, we'll do it in the area where the dune would have been built as part of beach nourishment if the beach had not accreted like it did in the five, six months between November and May. Thank you, Dave. Ma'am? Dave, I have three quick questions. Number one, can you tell us exactly where Reach 3 is? Number two, when will this start? And number three, would you go one more time for the public that's listening to the website and go down to where you find that form. 
I don't know the exact station numbers for Reach 3, but basically I believe Reach 4 starts about McCall Court, which is where the tapering begins to come back to no nourishment at the town line. So it's basically the 9,000 feet of the town, which is uh, about one and three quarter miles north of McCall Court. That's the area that's getting the greatest amount of sand added to the beach, and that's the area where they would have built a dune if the beach had not accreted. Um, this project, typically what we do is we'll take bids in September and we'll be ready to go you know, at, by the 15th of November. In the past, we've held off until the spring to put sand fencing out because we were concerned that if we put it in the fall and then we had a bad nor'easter season, we could lose a lot of it. I think our beach will be adequate protection to help this sand fence stay viable uh, through this winter and so we'll get started earlier this year than we have in the past For two reasons one we want to get sand fencing out there and start capturing the windblown sand and secondly We'll be putting out more in this year than we've ever put out in a single year before and finally your other question for people who are listening or uh, To those who will be reading about this in the media if you go to the town's website and I'll make sure that it's up and showing on the right hand side of the home page there'll be a story, a news story about sand fencing. You go to that story and there's a link you can click on and you can see the form. It's a one page form. You can't fill it out online, but you can print it. You can either fill it out and drop it off at Town Hall or Public Works. You can fax it to Public Works and I believe that the fax number is at the bottom of the form or you can mail it into the town if you are a uh, non-resident property owner but any one of those ways we'll get it into our hands and we'll get it on the spreadsheet and start scheduling the sand fencing that we're going to put up this fall great thank you very much Dave I think I heard you say bid it out this is a project that's done with contracted labor not with town labor that's that correct. correct that's correct okay. and and because sand fencing goes up in 10 foot sections at 45 degree angle at a minimum of 7 to 10 feet apart Typically what we do is, in our bid documents, we include a diagram which shows exactly how sand fencing is to be installed. And this, this comes right out of the camel regulations that show how it can be put up. And we bid it in 10-foot sections. And so the price that I use to come up with these estimates of how much we could put up in the past, we've had two years out of three when one year the bid was $31.5 per 10-foot section and the next year was $32. So that plus the fact that we're doing more this year. So that should also help us get a better unit price because we're doing a larger quantity. So the numbers that I gave you were, are really minimum numbers. We should be able to do more than that. Is that just the labor for that? For that's the, no, that's, that's the whole thing. That's including that's purchasing materials. the sand fencing wow. and, the, and the stakes that are used and the wire ties that tie it to the stakes and the labor. That is a turnkey job. Great. Anything else, Phil? Cliff? Let's see. Um, Commissioner's agenda. Commissioner Sadler. Okay, um, I have two items, and the first one is to discuss the Jeanette's Pier bathhouse cleaning, and I will, um, for the board, I will let you know that the manager of Jeanette's Pier is here in the audience, has been here. Thank you, Mike, for coming. The board charged me with um, some questions to get answers from, from the manager, and I will just go over those briefly, and then we can discuss from there. You asked me about a cleaning budget, um, and the manager has said that they did not initially budget to clean the bathhouse because they assumed that the town would be cleaning it based on past verbal agreements. The labor costs to clean the bathhouse are estimated to be between $8,765 and $9,740. This is based on 194 days that the bathhouse will be open this year. It takes anywhere from four and a half to five hours daily to clean at $10.04 an hour. Now, with regards to the schedule that both myself and you all and the newspaper and everybody else, um, I guess we should have said twice a day in a 24-hour period, but anyway. 
Um, the bathhouse requires cleaning twice daily. There is no set time for these cleanings, but the pier always makes time to clean it twice a day. All of this is dependent on the maintenance staff's other duties, which are cleaning and, and the maintenance of the pier house, the pier, the grounds, etc. If they have time to clean first thing in the morning, then they usually have to clean it again by late in the afternoon. If they're able to clean it entirely the last thing at night, then they usually don't go in and clean again until midday. Um, you, I believe, had asked about, you know, if they'd ever thought about subbing it out, uh, Mayor. And the, ma the manager said that they investigated putting together a cleaning contract for the bathhouse, but initial estimates came in at 17500 for the season, which runs from, this year it ran from the opening May 21 till they will close it November the 30th. This included all cleaning supplies as well as labor, although the pier was going to provide toilet paper and paper towels. Um, they realized it might be less expensive to try and do it themselves, so they have done that this year. Um, I would just open this for further discussion after you all have heard what he's had to say on the questions that you asked me to get answers for. And then Mike is here to answer any questions that what I have said may prompt you all to ask. Did Mike, did you want to add anything to that right right off the get go or? Oh uh, no, that's completely accurate what Commissioner Sadler just said. If you have any questions at all, I'll do my best to answer. Okay. Thank <coughs> you, sir. Thank you for coming and staying and listening. <laughs> staying and staying. It's late. Comments? What's the sir? Well, I'll say what I again what I said last meeting. I don't think the township put the money in Nags Head Pier or uh, Jeanette's Pier. We appreciate what the state has done for the town of Nags Head. We have our own bathhouses to clean. It was just I think two years ago when the vote on the budget was three to two in favor, but people voted against the budget because we didn't give Public Works the men they needed to one thing was clean the bathhouses and. And I think if we've got that much money to spend, we need to put it in our own town, on our own property. And I'm against supplement the state. I have concerns about it. I really would like to see us, and I'd like to see the Jeanette's Pier, as they move through their first season, do an evaluation of their, and a needs assessment of their staffing levels. And I know they, they have to look at it as a whole picture. And I don't think that that picture, that we've got the full picture. I, Commissioner Saber answered all the questions, but I think that we really need to see what happens as we go through the budget process and not work it outside the budget. Sir? Oh, I, I have, uh, I have, uh, I heard Gary, uh, I listen to Andy every day uh, about you know how they're getting screwed over by the state and the pier so, um, by what's going on and you know he, he mentioned some of it this evening so i can't support it even though it's probably a, a, you know, necessary it's, it's just it's just we uh you know we have an obligation to the other people that have peers in our I think they're, they're sure we, as far as it can be, everything can be on even key. Um, I do have a, a little bit of a question, if you, if you don't mind, Mike. Um, what, how, many, how many folks do you all have in that capacity? Uh, uh, we have four housekeepers on staff. Four, four housekeepers yeah. on staff? What, what are your alternatives? What are you looking at as options uh, if, if this doesn't get funded by the town? Um, we're just looking at cost reducing measures. For one thing, we'd probably take out the paper towel holders in the bathrooms because what we're finding is that they're being wasted. We do have hand dryers in there. So, I mean, it, it, that's one way of uh, cutting costs. Other than that, we'll just move forward. I, I honestly think that my housekeeping staff being put in the position they've been put in have done an excellent job of maintaining that bathhouse so far this summer during the peak season. And we've seen huge numbers of people coming through that facility so and we do recognize that the, the pier is a huge asset for 
the town of Nags Head and the, the bathhouse was an important part of that, that asset. Um, I, I do recall some of that discussion going back and forth there, though, on I think there were some changes on the design and that type of thing, and I think the, the Aquarium Society actually ended up applying for that grant and those type of things. Uh, so we do recognize that it's an important piece. Um, I, I'm not hearing consensus, though, on putting those dollars in at this point in time. Um, it, it's important to us that it, it stays clean, too, though. Uh, there, there's, we all have a, a need that. Taking the paper towel holders out of there should re result in fewer clogged toilets, based on my own experience. Most definitely. We've had that, we've had that problem this summer. If I may, Mayor, sure. I think the, um, the, the Aquarium Division, as they, as, uh, as they see it, um, probably would not have followed through and built a bathhouse if there wasn't an initial agreement from the town to maintain it and clean it during, its, during, the, uh, during the season when the bathhouse is open. Um, and I think that's the basis for, for the whole discussion here, is that uh, if, if that agreement wasn't laid out on the table in the first place, there probably wouldn't be a bathhouse on the site, or at least not one that the state pursued. So, uh, I, and that's, I just wanted to make that statement really quick. I understand. Are you, are you telling me that there was an agreement between the town? There was an agreement between the town and them? That we were it it sounds like there was, may have been some verbal discussion. There, there was a verbal discussion. I, as as I understand yes, it, I was not involved in that discussion. Yes, yeah, I, think it probably, I think it probably predated Mike and yes. predated me as, as well. Yeah. Yes, right. um, there were verbal discussions, and it was at the time when we were being asked to apply for the grant, but there were no discussions after we did not apply for the grant, and the state said and the state they wanted took to do their response. own design and their own backup. Well, let, let me earlier when we were involved in applying for grants. If I may, and I at this point would have loved to have shared my seat on the Jeanette's Peer Advisory Council with with this council. Because and Mike, I saw him at almost every meeting when Charlie Cameron was interim town manager. Charlie went, I went. Mike went and 14 other people, and then we met and met and met before, before the plans were ever drawn, and certainly before the groundbreaking. And the discussion from the get-go was that the county and the town had the land that the pier was going to be built upon, and the town requested that a bathhouse be built. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's as I remember it. What was the town's, um, what, were, what was their skin in the game? To clean the bathhouse. And if Charlie Cameron were here today, he would say the same thing, to clean the bathhouse. That's what we were going to do. We're not going to maintain it. And that was made very clear many times. Am I right? That's correct. But we were going to clean the bathhouse. We wanted a bathhouse. The people from Dare County, particularly Manio, they've always used Jeanette's Pier as the place to go to the beach. So we wanted a bathhouse. We did say that we would even um, apply for a grant for the bathhouse, as Renee has said. Well, the pier grew in size, and the bathhouse that we had assumed that we would probably get with something similar to what we have at um, Barn Street, or Bonnet, no, Barnes. And as the pier grew in size, and the pier house grew in size, I think that the architect could see that the visual bathhouse that we had uh, would not fit into the whole picture very well. So the bathhouse grew and, and, and became much more grander, most grand, than what we had. So um, at that point, I think we were told that we, we did not need to apply for the grant for the bathhouse, that that would all be taken care of through the whole process. Never at any time did Charlie Cameron or myself hear that that relieves you all from cleaning the bathhouse. That was a commitment that was made from day one. And I'm going to say it was an assumption. It was a verbal 
Uh, it wasn't a written agreement. You're absolutely correct. It was not. But that bathhouse is probably the most expensive and the best looking bathhouse on the East Coast. I'm very proud of that bathhouse. I've been in there. It, it's beautiful. It needs cleaning. And I feel very obligated to be a part of the cleaning. It's $9,500 a year. Now, I'm sure that as the peer um, proceeds along and hopefully makes more money as uh, the push continues to get a mandatory, and I hope Gary is listening. I was hoping he would stay. There is still people going to Raleigh to try to get Raleigh's change of mind. Am I right, Mike? Yesterday. To Yesterday, thank you. To make it mandatory for the $2 admission to walk on the pier. Um, as the income um, reaches higher levels than than what they have, um, maybe they won't need this. They need this money. And there are other ways that they could get this money. You know, there are a number of times that there are more people parked in their parking lot on the beach than there are in the pier house. What about a parking meter where everybody has to put quarters in the meter? You know, meter all of those wonderful parking spaces at the pier house. That, I feel sure, would bring in more than the, uh, the $9,500. Uh, and if you don't want to put meters up there, put a, put a parking attendant out there and charge everybody that goes there. And if you're on the beach, you pay. And if you go on the pier, you pay, but you get to stay and get your money back. I mean, there are ways. But is that Nags Head? I don't think so. And please, Mr. Newspaper, do not say I'm advocating parking meters. I am just saying that there are the ways to make money than what the pier is doing if they have no... Um, assistance with what Mr. Cameron and Anna Sadler listened to day after day and I reported every time I came back from those meetings I reported to this board. So I support the commitment that we made. I think that we have something here that certainly no other town on the Outer Banks has. Um, the pier is is a jewel that we've all waited for. Um, I, I just right. cannot believe that we would go back on a commitment that we made. And let me just say why I do not feel that we should clean the Nags Head Pier bathhouse nor the Outer Banks Pier bathhouse is because number one, those are private businesses They've always cleaned their bathhouses. That would be like me saying to um, Tortugas, just because that person walked in from the beach uh, and got an iced tea and used the bathroom, I'm going to clean their bathrooms too because he used the beach. Uh, Mr. Oliver has a, uh, a public beach access directly adjacent to his property. And I know because, as he said, my husband worked there for five years that people actually park in his lot and go to the beach. In the public parking area adjacent to him, people park there and go in the pier. So it has really doubled the size of his pier parking. Um, that's up to him whether he wants to allow people to use his bathroom. He can have a key in there. He doesn't have to let the guest of the beach go in there, but that's, that's Gary's open um, policy, and I commend him for it, but to to clean his bathhouse is totally, um, I think we've got oranges and probably uh, basketballs that we're trying to compare here, so I would just say that I support cleaning this bathhouse. Cliff has hired, finally hired a part-time person. I think that we could try, begin using that part-time person uh, next May when Mike reopens the bathhouse and give it a shot and if it just kills our budget, wrecks public works, then we may have to rethink it. But I'm asking you all to stick by the commitment that was made when this bathhouse was built, whether it was 
big or small or whatever and clean it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Mike, when do y'all, I assume your season is kind of going to go with the rest of the season, which is the summertime, so you're coming close to the end of it. Um, will, over the course of the winter, I wouldn't think you'd require quite as much cleaning. I mean, it won't be a twice a day job, I wouldn't think. Would, do y'all, is there an intent to close that down over the winter, or is it stay open? Uh, yes, Mayor, we, we intend to close uh, right after Thanksgiving weekend. So, we, but we will keep it open through the fall. You know, traditionally September, October, and early November are very strong fishing seasons, and we expect and and quite nice beach going seasons as well. And we fully expect that the beach will still be packed there, especially with certain events like the uh, Outer Banks Pro Surf Contest, um, the VIP Fishing Tournament, and several other things that come up in the fall. So, yeah. and then reopening back sometime in the May first. Uh, pro probably middle of May, um, prior, prior to late, uh, excuse me, Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, but uh, I doubt May 1st, probably more like May 15th or something like that. And I don't hear support on the board no. for doing it right now. Perhaps we can look at it in that budget process and in that, that whole budget piece, uh, maybe that can't, those dollars can be found. And there'll be enough time there, I think, that we can respond. Right. So Very much appreciated, Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Right. Appreciate Thank you coming you, this evening. Thank you. My second item of business mm -hmm. is I would like to discuss the lowering of the speed limit south of Whalebone Junction. I'm sure that um, all of you received the same email I did from a gentleman who is just south of, or right the, the Shell Station or the whalebone, is it what it's Exxon. The Exxon uh, asking for a consideration of the lowering of the speed limit from 35 to 25 since we have already lowered it. If you are driving south on the beach road and you come to the intersection there at Salmon Avenue is where you go to Old Oregon Inlet Road, we've already lowered that speed limit to 25 because of the increased activity in that area. And at first I thought, you know, leave well enough alone, but it, 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 it was not well enough alone. And I purposely went down there almost seven days in a row, but at different times. And I will tell you something. I'm amazed that people haven't been killed right in that area. And I'm sure Commissioner Cahoon has seen a lot of near misses in there. but. Well, first of all, I never got up to 35 miles an hour when I left the, in, went into Old Oregon Road. I never got up to it to way down. Because of the, of the masses of people and the bicycle and the baby carriages and the cars and, and everything down there. God, it's summer. But you know what? It's not a bad idea to keep that 25 mile an hour down to at least I'd suggest Diamond Shoals because that's actually when I was able to creep up. But the Comfort Inn, that, that commercial area, I'd like to see us um, ask public safety to, to look into this because I think it needs to be done before next year. I really do. I think it's, and I would encourage anybody on this board to just go down there anytime you get a minute. It's, it's, it's quite heavy. Now, is any of 1243 at 25 right now? When you turn, when you make that turn, it's it goes back to 35. 35. Right at, at the um, station, there's a sign that says 35. My right, Kevin, at, get, at uh, Wally Station is where it's, I It's 35 once you turn right on to Oregon Inlet Road and remains 35 down to the area of the uh, Station 21, the new fire station, and it increases to, to 45. 45 down. Correct. Just, as I said, just from there, it's a continuation. You're already doing 25. It's a continuation um, until, like I said, Comfort Inn, Diamond Shoals. <clears throat> Mayor, if I, if I, if I may, we, we uh, y'all approved the, you know, the purchase of a new radar trailer that's certainly capable of gathering data uh, in that area um, to do some vehicle counts. Um, I have not, I, I was, was not a recipient of the email that, that I guess the other uh, board and the manager received. Um, I personally would like to do 
some, some research with, with traffic counts, uh, see what the speeds are, uh, to, to see if it maybe needs to be fixed. I'm not aware of uh, an increased number of accidents uh, in that area. I did speak to one complainant that said that she was, uh, had seen an increase just because of the, she was attributing it to the, uh, to the pier. To the pier. Yeah. Um, but we can certainly deploy the radar trailer down there and try to get some numbers. I can also go back and look at, uh, to, to make sure that I'm correct in saying that the, the accidents in that area are not, it's not an increased number of accidents in that area. I mean, that, that seems like a, a reasonable idea to go ahead and get some data on it actually. And sometimes one person's perception is certainly different than right. the, the whole, but having the actual data from the radar piece would be good. Maybe. Mayor, could I make a suggestion with the radar trailer that it be deployed both during the busy season, and we only have Labor Day left, which is going to be Correct. the busy season, but have it deployed mm -hmm. after Labor Day as well to get an idea of the peak, which Labor Day is kind of semi-peak, but to get an idea of apples versus oranges? Actually, you've already left your peak, Renee, because, you know, a lot of the schools have started, so, I mean, and, and as you said earlier today, you've already noticed a decrease in the traffic as of yesterday, or day before, but um, I would encourage Kevin to get it out as, as soon as possible, but she's right, we need something after. Something to compare it to. Right, right. It will be there by the end of the week. By, by Friday, I can have it deployed, and the data that I come back for you will, will be uh, northbound, southbound traffic, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly take Commissioner Cahoon's uh, suggestion and, and, and do it, get some figures before and then after the season. Good. And I'll also research the accidents in that area. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Everybody okay with that? Nod your head. <laughs> okay. It's not that light. Uh, I, one comment. I went down there today and I said 15 minutes at Gulfstream. Traffic's moving slow. By the time the traffic reaches the company and heading north, traffic's slowing down. It's slowing down for either a turn left on Gulfstream or coming to the stop sign at the well road. But I didn't find traffic moving that fast. Thank you, sir. Mr. Settler, anything else? Reserve the right to. Uh, <laughs> no, you don't get two bites of the apple. I don't get two bites of the apple. No, I. That's it. About nine thirty, you know. No, I'll, I'll save it for the uh, September meeting. Yes, Pam. Okay, you. thank you, Bob. Commissioner Mott. Not a thing, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem. One thing. Uh, we had a discussion on debris left on the beach, different things left on the beach, and at night, Cliff and I took a trip from Eighth Street down to Seagull on Monday night. We started at 7 o'clock and people, most of the people are off the beach. Beaches are very clean. Very little stuff left on the beach, except frames for sun shields. Quite a few of those. We saw four volleyball nets. The beaches are left clean. I see no reason to interfere with our tourist people on the beach. Thank you, sir. Cliff? We'll not argue with that statement. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just notify the board that there's a CRC meeting next week, and at that meeting will be discussion of transition as the director is on effective September 1st. I'm assuming that there will be some plan submitted at that meeting as to how to move forward. Uh, it's not anticipated that a new director will be coming on board until later in the fall. Thank you. I have a couple, couple of quick items. You know. um, I had a request to ask the board to consider whether we would look at donating surplus property to a charity as opposed to auctioning on gov deals. Um, I didn't. I actually didn't have a chance to speak to Mr. Lighty on that. I'd ask y'all just to consider that, and maybe we can speak about it at a, a future meeting, and also get the whether we legally can do it or not. Um, second. I'd love to see us bring the carnival back. Um, if we can do that, and even if we have to share revenues with the, the Tourism Bureau, I think we still come out ahead. Um, is anybody, would anybody like to do that or try to do that? Uh, when are you talking about bringing it back? As soon as we can. You mean the winner? Um, at, at least for next, uh, at least for next June. Oh, but I, I could see doing it in September, y'all. Um, I, actually, I could see us. I could see us doing it the first week 
after Memorial Day, kind of similar time to when we did it this year, and then the last week in August, I think would be a good time to, to bring something like, like that the in. the first week that school is out and then the last week before school takes in. Um, it's the tourism board meets tomorrow morning at 8.15. <laughs> um, and and the, uh, the tourism board is wrestling with um, a rental understanding right now and, and for profit and non-profit and rates and days of use, et cetera and long-term use versus three-day events, which would take a day here and there to set up. So um, that's going to play into your, your week's rental. And the only other thing I want to say about that is I'd love to see the carnival back, but we cannot do, in my opinion, a, another trailer park in town on that property. Of course, there is a place where they can put them. And so, um, I, I, that was the only negative comment that I heard about the whole, the whole, the whole thing was, you know, how could you allow trailers um, parked there? And I, 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 something else that very good that I will mark down to bring up, um, would that be allowed once they do their rental um, understanding? Well, please tell them. I think we. We'd really like to have that opportunity. I to think get. the whole county. And we'd even would like to. we'd even share the the revenues in the percentage of ownership. I think. And we could probably even rent them spaces <laughs> at Marine Wanchies at that park for them to park. Possibly so. Might anyway, be an opportunity also for. They're working for, on it, Bob. Might be an, also an opportunity for um, some of the civic organizations to do the parking rather than, um, and they would maybe have a possibility to to generate some funds for the Rotary or the Kiwanis or those type of things as well. Well, they could charge for parking possibly where we didn't because we were free labor. Exactly. <laughs> free labor doesn't come cheap. Um, I would like to see us uh, look at approaching sandbags the same way that we did beach pushes and following in ducks footsteps and would, would ask the board if, they, if we would have consensus to bring something forward on that uh, model similar to, to what Duck has done. Can we direct it to the planning board and have it come back? Yes, ma'am. Through, through the process. Yes. Through the process. Did you get any calls about uh, beach pushes down there this week? You sent out, Somebody sent out an email saying those people coming to town hall mm -hmm. to protest. I did. I did. Did, we, did we get complaints at town hall about our beach push uh, that, that what the, I thought I made very clear in that email the reason that those people were going to come to town hall was because of the gap that had been left there so long between where the Texas stopped and the Liberty stopped and left that. In fact, there was a pond there for a while, yeah. but they were worried about the approaching storms and they wanted an emergency beach push. After finding out that the text that the Liberty was going to return uh, within the, uh, after fueling, um, I was told that they decided <coughs> to use that approaching weight. And that gap has been filled or will be filled. It almost ought to be in the process. process. It's, it's okay. good. It is almost there. Good. Is there consensus on having sandbags go through the, the planning board process? Yes. Is, am I clear that this is the same um, ordinance that Doc that Something that similar. Uh, something similar, similar to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay. Is that clear enough direction? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, lastly, if, if we can have a, a brief closed session to review the manager's contract. I promise won't keep you very long. I think we've had some discussion on it and uh, should be fairly quick, but y'all can always vote it down. <laughs> That's the last thing I've got. Um, well, and see, even to the, it's on my agenda. Uh, I'll, I'll make that motion that we adjourn to the, to, uh, the manager's review and uh, a manager's contract review in the closed session. 
I hear no seconds. Second. I have seconds subject to the legal verbiage. Yeah, Motion is pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A6. Yes, sir. Uh, further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes. We're in a brief closed session. We're going to come back in open session from a brief closed session. We did take an action in the closed session, and that was to approve the manager's contract for a, a two-year agreement beginning September 1st, 2011, and lasting until August 31st, 2013. Is there any further business to come before the board this evening? Do you need a motion to contract in open session? Yes, I do, apparently. I beg your pardon. Thank you very much. I make that motion to approve the contract that you just described. Second. We have a motion on the floor and we have a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Ogburn. Thank Congratu you. Congratulations. Thank you. Surviving two years. <laughs> Is there any further business to come before the board this evening? Motion to adjourn is in order. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. We're adjourned.